Um, my name is Stafford Horn, and I'm pretty much a hobbyist. I'm not working for any company like Arm or Sony or anything. I work for a finance company, but in the evenings, I work on Open Risk. And um, this, has anybody, has everyone heard of Open Risk, or has anyone not? A few people? And I, I, I was going to ask first off um, some questions, but I know people are probably, they know a lot of this stuff, so everyone knows what an FPGA is? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I wasn't sure of the audience, but after hearing a lot of talks, I found everyone probably does know this stuff. Has anyone ever written an IP core themselves? Yeah? Um, have you heard of open cores? Yeah? Oh, cool. And um, have you used FuseSock before? Or have you heard of Fossi? Okay, good. I'm going to talk about a few of these. And um, first off, what is open risk? It's um, officially, it's an architecture called Open Risk 1000. That's the specification. <coughs> Um, up on the right, we can see OR1200, or 1200. That's one of the first implementations from uh, 1999. So it's been around for quite some time, and it, it started off as a open source risk architecture that has a five-stage pipeline with a delay slot. So whenever there's a jump, you know you're going to take some time to put an instruction in there. But, um, Kind of old fashioned, not really needed anymore. Like, uh, most of the generations are the race lot, 32 demo purpose registers. It has DSP extensions. Um, it has separate instruction and data menu, and also separate instruction and data caches. And um, it has Linux support in the main line since about 2010. It's had Linux support since it was um, created in 2001. And um, currently, I have a consumer class $100 FPGA, and I can run this processor at 50 megahertz and it boots Linux in five seconds. So it's still use useful, um, but that's with 32 megabytes of RAM. It's not quite an embedded system, but it can be stripped down. I'll, I'll show a bit about that later. But. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention is that it, it's quite modular, so I'm going to get away from the mic, but this is some Verilog code, and if you look at it, um, this shows that you know, this is your CPU, and then you actually include in Verilog um, your, your modules, and this is the one processor, the more 1KX, has multiple implementations in it. And uh, you can, I thought it had one from but you can um, select with all the parameters the um, if you want to have a data cache, how big your, how many ways your data cache is, or if you want an MMU or so forth, that can be selected. And also, you can swap out. In this case, it says um, cappuccino. You can actually swap out the pipeline. So there's a thing. In this particular um, core, there's a cappuccino, which is a five-stage pipeline, and there's an espresso pipeline, which is actually a two-stage pipeline, which is much more compact. Um, but it, it also doesn't have data caches or MMUs, and then there's some other options. Yeah. This is some assembly. I just wanted to show things like the um, the delay slot. So whenever you jump, you have to make sure that the next instruction is um, going to do something or nothing. So here is a case where you have a no op for the next instruction. A lot of cases for your loops, you would put the increment. So you would jump at the flag and then you would implement the increment in the delay slot so you can do an extra um, operation. Any questions? Oh. Oh no, I did have that slide, sorry. Yeah, so actually, um, there are no 64-bit implementations. Um, even though it's in the spec, there's the OR1200, that's from um, 2000. The Immor Immor 1KX, that was written more recently in 2012, 
And that's the one that I was saying is modular. It has the cappuccino, the five-stage um, pipeline of cashing in and you, and then there's two other ones. So you can swap these out during your build cycle. Um, you say, I want this processor, and I can just um, cater for different sizes without having to change maybe my bus logic or without having to change the program if it doesn't depend on the MMU, for example. Any questions? <coughs> Want it to be interactive. Um, another thing about OpenRisk is that it's open and there's a lot of IP cores that are available on this open cores website, which I mentioned before. And one of the things that all the IP cores try to do is, is use a common language. So if you go to Altera or to Xilinx and they give you an IP core, the protocol they will use will be their proprietary protocol. Like for uh, Xilinx, it's I think Core Connect, and Altera, they have an Avalon bus. Um, but for all these open cores, we didn't want to use proprietary ones or use a proprietary arbiter or anything like that. Um, so we've used the, the Wishbone Interconnect, which was actually developed by the open core, one of the members of the open cores um, probably 15 years ago. And that you can find a lot of cores in open cores that provide this, this protocol. Also, there are um, bridges, so Avalon to Wishbone or Avalon to AXI. And it, it makes it so that these cores are really reusable. And um, yeah, so I mentioned a few things, but if you want to look more, there's a link to the spec there. Right. Any questions about that? Okay. But another thing is people have probably heard quite a bit about Risk Five lately. Risk Five is in the news, and um, it's actually kind of the predecessor, or it's kind of like the grandchild of Open Risk. Risk Five, when the people were creating it. It actually talked to the open risk people. It was created, I think, out of an open risk conference. And they talked to the open risk people and said, you know, is this instruction set something we can go forward with? Is this the processor we want to use, open risk? And they they basically decided and we agreed that open risk is um, not as extensible as we would want it to be. So the instruction set, um, the encoding is doesn't have as much places to be extended. Also, one of the risk five things, they wanted to have variable width instructions, so you can have it on more compact systems. Um, but yeah, so risk five is very popular, but if we look at some of the comparisons between other soft cores, like the Neos 2 um, from Altera or Microblaze, is what are the differences or some of the important things and why is risk Open risk still a new thing. Um, one is so open risk and risk five are open, so you can look at the Verilog code, um, you can change it, and you don't have to pay licenses to anybody to put it in silicon um, or to even use it in that product. Um, open risk has it. One, one of the things about risk five though that you might not know is that it doesn't provide a whole architecture. So I think. You know, open risk we recommend you would use the wishbone bus. Um, risk five, they kind of use whatever bus they want. It depends on each implementation. Um, open risk we have a, a NM, an MMU that's in the spec, how to use it, the instructions, the, the protocol for our MMU. Risk five, everyone if you want an MMU, it's not in the spec. So you have to come up with your own. So that makes it kind of difficult. I think for them to support Linux. They have an implementation with an MMU, but it's not spec. So if somebody, another company comes around and they want to um, use Linux with their open risk processor, they, will, they won't have a spec MMU. It's kind of an interesting scenario. Um, open risk is 32-bit Linux, and uh, risk 5 is mostly 64-bit. So. Um, I think OpenRisk does well on smaller platforms, I think, if you have a more constrained system. Uh, OpenRisk is upstream and Linux, and most of the other, the tool chain is, is also upstream. There are some issues I'll talk about later. Um, and then, but in terms of silicon, OpenRisk 
is limited. There are not been many silicon tape outs. Uh, it's because it you know, hasn't had a lot of backing from big companies. And also, it's, uh, it's well, most people use it on a PGA right now. Risk five, that they've been starting to do a lot of um, tape outs, and so that's very proven. Then Neos too, and Microblaze, you get support from those big companies. And the videos are coming up to this, not everyone too. So those are pretty interesting things to look at. Any questions on the differences? Or? Okay. Yeah, so another thing I wanted to mention was this view sock. So if this is something that's used and it's come out of the open risk and open closed community is uh, if you are building a system on chip, or if you're building, you know, and, and trying to share code for IP cores, um, it's, it's not so easy. Uh, in the software world, if we have software and you, you have a program that you want to build on a different process or something, we, we can build them, we can build our code with GCC or MAKE. Um, I mean, that's not the compilers, but basically you're building for software like GCC and MAKE. Um, if you want to do dynamic linking or if you want to communicate with other things, there's you know, the L format or there's ABIs that are well defined. There's a class path, LB path to load up, to, to find your code and load up libraries. Um, if you're writing a program and you want to import, you have headers that you can in include or you know, in Java they have import. Or all languages they have some method of importing. But in hardware world, if you want to, let, let's say you have a project where you have CPU core. Currently, the way you do it is you have to use the company's proprietary mechanism. So for Altera, you know, you'd have to download their core in, through their core builder, and you build everything together in their proprietary system. So you can't really share that um, on an open source community like on GitHub or something. Um, and mostly what people do is, They'll get their CPU core, they'll copy the code for their SD RAM core, they'll copy the USB core, all their code will be in their project, and then they'll, you know, they'll build it through Quarkus or whatever program does. So that's really an issue with the in the hardware world is sharing code and, and having modular build is not well de defined. Um, and FuseSoft it, it basically solves that problem. So um, it allows you to have your cores, basically, these cores get pulled from GitHub with the version. So you have a core file that says, I, wanna, I want to get this CPU version, and um, I want to get this SD RAM version, and I want to get this USB core. And so what you have in your project is maybe just your wishbone bus interconnect logic and some pin map, and you can build it. and. When you build it, you can build it against Xilinx, or you can build it against Altera, or you can, um, and it will ask for the bitstream, or you can even simulate it on things like uh, Verilator, which is a Verilog simulation platform. So this, this is really powerful, and I think um, if anyone is doing their own system on chips, looking at something like this, good. Any questions? I think I'll probably get to this presentation. Um, so, a brief history of um, open risk and where it is today. So, as I mentioned, in 2000, open risk was, in 2000, 1999, it was created. Um, the tool chains, they had patches for GCC, DDB, um, there was some UC, LibC, a micro LibC, I think. Well, and, and those were all um, put together and they created open cores to, to share all of their um, developments. But actually, in, in 2005, the founders of Open Risk and Open Cores, they joined a company. And basically, it was abandoned for some time. Those, those people, they joined the company, they made everything um, closed source, they, they took all the code and <coughs> they developed it on their own. And um, that's kind of why there hasn't been so much um, open risk development uh, for some time. It, it changed hands to another company, Orsoc AB, um, 
and then this company went bankrupt last year. <laughs> and, uh, so really, it's um, it's gone kind of in waves, ups and downs. And in 2015, there was a new corporation, all funded by free and open source software, not funded by any companies. Um, maybe not free, and open, not funded by free and open source, but funded by. Um, free and open source software people. So like me, I would contribute money for the other members. We all just contribute our own money to keep the websites going, to keep, uh, we have Jenkins builds that will build and test um, the actual, like, not, not testing the programs running on the boards always, but making sure that the Verilog um, designs are formally tested and making sure certain state changes are basically formal testing. And um, the current websites that we have are, there's Libra cores, which we do, we try to get away from open cores because this company still owns it and they won't give up the domain. So we create Libra cores. Um, there's all of the cores that were in open cores have been mirrored onto this free course. And then open risk is, is openrisk.io that we're working on maintaining. Um, give me the documentation and news, news is coming through there. Any question? Yeah? Is this related to OPF.org at all? OPF? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. Do you know if that's about OPF? Uh, it's the Open Processor Foundation? Uh, I don't think so. to just give a 
some background of what is open risk. And I, then I want to talk about just what I'm doing in open risk and how I got started. So actually, I got started um, last year or in the beginning of 2015, maybe a little bit before that. I I was working on hardware designing circuits, and I thought, well, you know, I was designing analog circuit, and I thought, well, you know, I know FPGA development, I know digital design, maybe I can build a, maybe I can relearn that, because I, I learned that in university, and I took a job in software, I work in the finance industry, so it's not really related to um, embedded systems, but I, I had the knowledge, so I thought I should try to refresh that. So I was, I got interested in hardware design for some reason, um, and I, I built an amp, an amplifier, and um, I used, for example, a setting off banners again, and I, okay, let me build an amplifier, it's a preamp for a microphone, and I, then I bought a FPGA, and I thought, well, you know, let me get an FPGA, and I'll build all the components for a computer around it. So if I want a sound card, instead of it having a built-in sound, you know, outlet or sound port, let me build it myself. So I built the circuitry for um, the preamp for microphone, and I would put that into the FPGA chip, and then also on the output side, I built the. Um, circuitry for a speaker and I don't really have an amp on there, it just has very, very low um, output, uh, low, low output current, but anyway, um, but inside of here is all digital, so in the end, what I ended up with was something like this, um, I built a all from scratch, just writing um, all the error log and a, IP myself, a sound recorder, so similar to what you're doing, but completely different. Uh, small scale, so I have like a push button. So I press, but this thing, it has uh, just two buttons on it. So I want to like be able to reset, I need a reset button, but then I also want to be able to play and stop and then record. So I build like a little circuit that could detect double clicks, so I would know if I double click, it would um, be a recorder if I would click once it would play back. And um, the thing I, the blue here is actually different clock domains. So I wanted to build things, I wanted to play with cross domain, uh, domain clock domain crossing. So because I thought, well, the DRAM should of course run at the fastest possible speed. So DRAM runs at 100 megahertz, but you know, my the sound doesn't need to be that fast, so I can maybe save power and run my sound and my recorder at one megahertz, and then I would have a FIFO, just like the audio buffer kind of thing. And uh, I wrote the FIFO myself. That was quite interesting to do with clock domain crossing. Um, and yeah, so there's a state machine. If I would click the button, the state would become recording, and it would read from the audio ABC chip that's on the board. Um, and it's SPI interface to read and write to the FIFO, and then when I stop it, it will switch to and read from the DRAM and then uh, write to the adaptive, also SPI. Uh, the DRAM controller I also wrote myself, and that took some time, but it was quite interesting um, experience. Anyway, any questions about that? Yeah, so, after I wrote this all from scratch, I thought, well, you know, I'm probably not going to sell any of this IP. It's just for fun. So I thought, well, let me see what's out there. How can I share IP with other people? And that's where I kind of, I found open risk. Um, this was just a picture of that thing running. And I was, if I would talk, it would, there would be a meter that would go up and down to show that I was talking. And that was, but I thought, well, I have all of this IP, I, um, but I should be able to build off of what other people are doing. So I did some searches and I found the open source community. And um, also I found that I could run Linux on this little board here. And that was how I got started. Uh, the, good, the transition.
information is not so good, but basically, I got started and I started to get Linux to run on the board, but it wouldn't work, so I spent a long time debugging it. It turned out that like their SOC had a refresh cycle on the memory that was, um, it was a little too long for my board. For some reason, like uh, this company, Teresic, they changed to use lower quality SDRAM later, and so the ones that they had, that the person who was working on the system before had a maybe like, I don't know, 24 millisecond refresh time, and mine required a 16, so I had to switch up the cycles, and then when it started, and I was like, wow, this is amazing, and I was hooked. But then I started to talk to them, and they were like, well, you know, our GCC version is, it's not been upstream. So they, they needed help. Once I got Linux building, um, while I was building it, I had to build a tool chain, and I found that you know, their versions of tool chain were really old. Uh, GDB, they had a, a lot of different repositories with GDB patches in it, and I thought you know, I should help getting this sort of out so that in the future when people come, they can have an easier time getting GCC set up. So they're currently on GCC version 5.3.4, Right, 3.0. Actually, I released 5.4.0, but upstream, there's uh, they're already working on 7. So we, we're way behind with our DCC release. And one of the reasons is we've never up um, upstream in DCC patches. And the reason was actually the people who went to be on Semiconductor. They didn't sign over their FSF copyright, and one guy will not sign it over because his board of directors say, you can't do this because it's going to in, you know, impact our IP or something like that. And so there's a bit of a problem with GCC that we're trying to work out now, because we think that most of his original work has been rewritten. Um, so hopefully someday we will be able to start submitting patches upstream. <coughs> But on the other side, there's Newlib. Newlib is the libc bare metal um, implementation. There's also Musil. Musil, everything is upstream, there's no issue. Um, but Newlib is what most people use when they use um, OpenList. And there are a few patches pending upstream. And I just got my FSF copyright assignment papers. I need to sign those and then I can hopefully send them upstream, but I'll mention one thing. So GDB was the first thing that I, I've been working with GDB a lot because of a few things I'll mention, but it's, we're planning, we're, I've already sent the patches upstream for GDB. This was quite interesting because those patches were sitting around since 2008, and I don't know how many people have worked with FSF, but when you submit things upstream, they, I mean, the same with the Linux kernel, but FSF has a few weird things like the change log. You have to manage a change log for everything. So it's eight years of change log that I have to go through and make sure everything is in order. And then they wanted all the patches um, squashed, basically. So I, I did that, and that, that wasn't a problem. But yeah, I, I'm working now through a few other things. Like the code had Doxygen comments on it and they want to remove all of those because they don't like comments in their code. And, um, but they, they gave us a lot of good feedback and we're getting those um, fixed and going upstream. Um, what I worked on last year is we had, a, as I mentioned, GDB was in a bunch of different repositories. I got all the code into the main um, repository, the Binion Tools repository for OpenRisk on GitHub. And I worked on testing, so I ran the testing suite. There's a GNU, Beige Avenue, which you do make a check. And it had a lot of failures, so I, I worked on fixing a lot of the bugs. And now there are many less test failures. Um, also, in order to get the test working, there's a simulator support built into GDB. I don't know how many people know about the GDB internal simulator, but I had to port that, which wasn't really working, so um, I got the simulator working in the top here. So this is the test result. So 
before somebody had posted a patch um, using, so basically there was like a shim where the GDB, when it would run the test, the simulator would actually connect off to our own simulator, like QEMU, but so those tests could run, but that wouldn't really be um, supported upstream. They don't want, basically GDB want all of their tests to be internal. Um, so I created the native simulator, and before we were getting 450 failures, now it's 404. A lot of, there's some failures that are due to the simulator doesn't support things like in-map or something like that, which I, I don't want to, I, I think, since we don't support Linux through GDP right now, it's just bare metal. Um, I think that's okay. Um, we're gonna work on Linux later, but uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's making some good progress. Another thing is, um, yeah, this is how the simulator works. So let's say you have a test by some data structure and you have another data structure and you have some function and you have the main code that, so basically you'll have your test data and you would set the data to hello and then you would call foo test data you would expect that foo to you know, just return something. Now what you can do with the simulator, which is something interesting is, you can okay, say target sim, you load, you should load that test, you put a breakpoint on main and you can run, and when it breaks, um, you can call like print foo with um, GDB, G data, and this is actually, so it's not calling with this data, but it's with some other static data, and it would be able to return that. So this was actually a test case I was working on, which is kind of interesting, because this requires GDB, while your program is running, it will swap it, and it will create a dummy stack, and it will create your dummy stack frame, and then tell your program to run, and after the stack frame, it puts a, you know, another trap. And there were some problems with the stack frame creation in the original code, which I, I fixed. The ABI for open risk is quite strange, um, but I won't go into that. Any questions on this? Do people know about like the GDP sim? No? Anyway. I, I think in, in the kernel, most people don't actually use GDB. Yeah, that's a bit about the, the ABI. Um, structs and unions are passed as pointers. So every time you pass a struct, it's passed as a pointer. Passed as a pointer. But you know, in x86, or almost every single other AB, ABI, structs and unions are passed. Um, they just put them in the, and they're passed in the registers. And if you have a big you'll just put it in the registers and if it ran out registers and you stick them on the, the stack. Um, variadic arguments are also, so then the other is that if you ever have any variadic arguments, like the dot 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 in your printf, those are always passed on the stack no matter what. And that's an inconsistency with a lot of other um, APIs. So that makes this kind of thing right here very complicated. So from within GDB, creating a dummy stack to <coughs> okay. um, copy things onto the target and, and then create a pointer to something on the target rather than a pointer to, to something that's, it, it makes, uh, you have questions about um, So in Linux, um, there have been no upstream, upstream patches since 2012. Uh, I've wanted to get these upstream as well, and <coughs> working all the on all the tool chain stuff, but also I've been working on Linux, and I started off by just making patches myself, studying the code and looking a lot, but there was another guy who said he would, you know, he would work on getting things upstream, and he didn't really have time. He, he does help me a lot with all my questions, but um, in the end, I basically started to work on doing all of the upstream effort. I got all the patches. We have a lot of patches in the backlog. So there's patches for SMP support. There's patches for a lot of the open cores IP. Um, but I pulled out basically all the patches that are <coughs> working a lot of the <coughs> systems right now. 
I'm breaking the build and I put them in a commit queue. So that those are the easy ones to go. So those are actually ready to go to the next commit merge window. And um, yeah, that is very good. And but then other things I've worked on myself is, for example, man copy. So during the build, or during the boot up, I found that it was taking seven seconds to boot. And I noticed there was one place where it actually took seven seconds. And it's actually, when the kernel boots up, it will copy the, the image from one place to in RAM to another place in RAM, and it will unzip it. And it uses mem copy quite a lot there. The, old, the default kernel mem copy is byte <coughs> based mem copy. So if you, every, almost every architecture uses a architecture specific mem copy, which can take advantage of knowing that the architecture is 32 bit and do word, co word mem copy or something like that. So I created one for, um, for open source. And we increase the boot time of 75. Not that much, but it's pretty good. Um, and I actually went through a, a few different um, iterations between you know, what's most complex and, and what is most optimized. And we just, so there was an idea to have you know, an copy routine that does word copies and then unrolls loops 16 times and it can handle misaligned copies and everything. And that's quite complicated. Um, and compared to just doing plain word copies, it wasn't that much faster. So we just settled on, on implementation of word copies. And it's three times better than the just plain byte copies, which is, is great. Another thing is there's an old boot man system in the Linux kernel, which is how the Linux kernel you know, initialized the memory manager. And um, I migrated that to a new APIs, which are much cleaner, and then block. And that has, has not really many benefits other than just cleaning up the old code. And, yeah, so yeah, any questions on Linux or open this? What I want to do after I get all of these things upstream and the DCC and EDB sorted out is go back to my application and use, instead of writing the cores all myself, use the open cores, write in a few cores, and use Linux and build a basically open, I can use AC97 or something, but use a, um, I use an open source use sound card drivers, make a real sound system that is running on Linux rather than um, just all plain hardware. And, uh, that's what I hope to do in the future sometime. But that's about it. Um, on the web, we have the, all the repos under GitHub open risk. On free node, we're on open risk. And there's a mailing list, and there's other websites I mentioned before. About it. Any questions?
like normal function in Google, you just want to optimize it. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that it's very popular in, um, I guess, optimization of things like <coughs> Microsoft says that they're optimizing certain parts of their search using FPGAs. And I know that in finance, the high frequency trading, they want to optimize things, but they don't have hardware experts. So something like that does make a lot of sense. Is, is that what you're mentioning? Is that what you're thinking about? Um, I think it's going to be kind of a trend from now on. Yeah, I think so. And there's some news that next year, um, Intel will release a chip with Altera right. on it. That probably will want to use that type of technology. But not really any open source developments I know on that. No other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, how do you define or, or uh, design the uh, instruction set? Oh, how do we design the instructions yeah. for open risk? Okay. I didn't uh, design it. Uh, <laughs> I think you, you usually, I think what they've done is looked at past one. So if you look at the mix processor, or even, yeah, there are a few um, basic risk processes, and you look at the instructions, and you say, okay, I want, like, in open risk, there's no move, for example. I want to reduce the instructions, so I don't want to move. I want just to add, and I want to track, and I want jump, and these kind of things. And you just create, you build up your, your own encoding for those that you want all your jumps to start with the one zero zero and all your ads start with one one zero and then you can code how your I, I don't know what's the best way to do it actually I haven't done it before but so, so I basically you copy at some major lists and yeah. you add that uh, some instruction. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think what you do I mean with any engineering problem, if you want to design something you look at what's out there and figure out their deficiencies and they would, you'd build a new one. So for open risk, it was designed a long time ago. I, I know it was based on something else, and I, I don't remember what that was, but for example, risk five, I think they looked at open risk and thought, well, it's missing the ability to extend um, the instruction set, so let's build that in. And, but other than that, they used most of the same concepts. Does anyone else know what's the best way to just define an instruction set architecture? <laughs> no, I, 